Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Francis Rosenbluth, Deputy Provost for the Social Sciences and Faculty Development at Yale University. Professor Rosenbluth is a comparative political economist with research interests in war and constitutions, Japanese politics and political economy, and the political economy of gender. The author of numerous articles and book chapters, Professor Rosenbluth has written several books, The Politics of Oligarchy, Institutional Choice in Imperial Japan, Japan's Political Marketplace, Financial Politics in Contemporary Japan, and Japan Transformed, Political Change and Economic Reform. Today we'll speak with her about her newest book, Women, Work, and Power, The Political Economy of Gender Inequality. Welcome, Professor Rosenbluth. Thanks for having me. So what is the premise of your book? Uh, this book is about the political economy of gender. And what we attempt to do in this book is to excavate reasons for why women have lower status than men in politics, economics, and society. And it's, it's common to think about this problem from a number of angles. For example, exploring the reasons behind gender stereotypes and unfavorable views of women. But in this book, we are putting aside for now the unconscious bias that people may have towards women and focusing instead on structural reasons in the economy and in politics for why women do not achieve the same levels of prominence as men. Okay, so why hold aside the bias and stereotypes? Well, we're not arguing that these things don't matter and that they don't exist, but we are trying to explain why they have come to be the way they are. So in a sense, we're trying to understand why gender norms are the way they are. Why are women viewed differently from men? And so we do that with uh, the standard tools of political economy. Okay, and what are those tools, and how can they help explain why patriarchy has been so prevalent throughout the world for so long? The standard tools of political economy uh, begin with basic microeconomic analysis of the marketplace, and in particular, we focus on labor markets. Uh, we try to understand why efficiency concerns, efficiency considerations by corporations, by employers, may lead them to avoid hiring and promoting women at the same rate as men. And how that in turn leads to a lower demand for female labor than male labor, which translates into weaker bargaining power by women in their family unit, where the female is earning less money than the male and therefore has to put more effort emphasis as well as effort into keeping the family going as a unit because she can't rely on her own uh, remunerative capacity, her own money-making capability. She really needs a male patron to um, ensure her livelihood. Okay, and in doing your research, what countries have you looked at? This book is comparative. It focuses mostly on the developed world rich democracies. Um, but we also, at the beginning of the book, take it all the way back to prehistoric times to give a very long overview of females, uh, status of females uh, relative to males in human society. And you start actually with the hunter-gatherers and things seem to have been a little bit different back then um, than they are today. Right. So. The, the data we have for understanding hunter-gatherer societies is, of course, very imperfect, mm -hmm. uh, incomplete. So we're relying primarily on physical anthropologists who have uncovered uh, various kinds of data, including the size of bones or artifacts, as well as anthropologists who study hunter-gatherer societies today. These are not perfect examples of hunter-gatherer societies as they must have existed because they have been contaminated, I suppose you could say, mm -hmm. by their contact with modern uh, developed societies. But hunter-gatherer societies, as far as we can say, um, were more gender egalitarian than the sedentary agricultural societies that followed them. 
The reason, we suggest, is because females in those societies were able to raise their own food sources. Uh, they weren't hunters primarily, they were, they were gatherers, but the food they gathered, the legumes, the, the you know, fruits and berries, whatever they were collecting from their environments for their families, seem to have accounted for almost four-fifths of the caloric intake of those early societies. Wow. And the fact that they were able to provide their own food and those for their children if necessary in the absence of a male patron made it possible for them to consider the possibility of leaving a unsatisfactory relationship with a male. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we are today. Um, why do you think that men have dominated the world um, for so very long? We focus on the change in relationships between men and women that occurred principally with the onset of sedentary agriculture. Okay. And what the establishment of fixed communities did was to put a premium on male brawn, the ability of males to till intensively the land, often with the help of livestock, and to protect the food or the community that was fixed in a position and to protect the stored um, assets of the community. So this led to a division of labor within societies, within families, where the males specialized in the production of food, females specialized in the care of children, and any kind of work they could do that was consistent with continued care of children. This isn't to say that females don't also engage in agriculture, and I'm sure uh, you know that in the developing world, women do a lot of agriculture, so male brawn did not push women out of agriculture altogether, but when the work that women do is part of a family unit, a family enterprise, a family farm, mm -hmm. she is not mobile. She cannot take her investment in those skills and move them to another family because she is really rooted. Her assets are in that family. Okay. So do uh, politics and government policies influence the gender gap? Certainly. Um, governments can do a lot to help assuage the, the problems that females face in, in weak uh, bargaining within modern society. Um, but some of the policies that governments enact to try to help women have unintended consequences that may not be helpful. So for example, here's, here's something that was paradoxical to me as I was studying this problem. Mm -hmm. You think about the welfare states in Europe and the fact that they protect labor, they raise the floor under, under wages, and given that women tend to be clustered at the bottom, you would think that this would be a very f female or gender-friendly thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it has the paradoxical effect of increasing the cost to an employer of hiring a woman if a woman is nonetheless more likely to interrupt her career to take care of family and to do family work. So the fact that a company has to have a long-term contract with a woman, has to hire her at a certain minimum rate of salary, means that they are required to pay a woman more than her productivity or her contribution to the company may warrant if um, the, the cost to the company of her career interruption is, is less than the cost to a company of a man's employment, which is continuous and uninterrupted. Okay. And if we, if we look at today, since women and men are arguably equally equipped um, in the labor market, do you think male domination in the United States is now the result of a cultural phenomenon perpetuated by this very long um, history of it being that way? Uh, I think that there is a lot of cultural inertia, mm -hmm. and so although we are no longer in a, an agricultural society, a lot of the norms that we espouse uh, unconsciously are left over from an earlier period. So mm -hmm. 
Um, I do think that's true to a certain extent. Uh, but I also think that norms, gender norms in the United States and elsewhere have changed quite a lot mm -hmm. so that we can expect um, better treatment now than our ancestors even a few generations ago. Sure, sure. So why study um, gender inequality? Well, I think although we've come a long way, there's still quite a ways to go. So it's partly just to uh, try to unpack this puzzle of mm -hmm. why, despite the fact that we espouse these, these goals of equality, it's so hard for us to, to have real equality. Um, and this book is an attempt to um, make an inroad into that question. Okay, wonderful. And I can't help but conclude the interview today by asking you, do you think um, at any point in the future that women would rule the world? Um, rule the world, probably not. <laughs> but be more equal, certainly, I hope so. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your research. Thank you very much for having me. For more information about Professor Rosenbluth and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.